When my name was Kyoko, chapter 14, Teyul. Soon he comes into the house with uncle's lunchbox in her hand. I'm in the sitting room with Abuji. Amoni's in the courtyard covering the kimchi jar. We all see her come in. Soon he looks at Abuji. Uncle says he won't be coming home tonight. Her voice is shaky, like she might start crying any second. He'll be away for a while. He doesn't know how long. Abuji closes his eyes. He doesn't say anything at first, then speaks without opening them. If anyone should ask, we will tell the truth. We do not know where my brother has gone or when he will be back. We do not know. That is all That is all any of you need to say. He opens his eyes and looks at his heart. And whatever happens tonight, you are not to leave the house. When he says those last words, he looks right at me. He doesn't seem surprised. Upset, maybe, but not surprised. The same for Omoni. She doesn't e ask Sunhi even a single question. It's almost like they expected this. Whatever happens tonight, what's going to happen? Sunhi looks scared. She catches my eye and slips out the back door. I follow her a, a few minutes later. She's crouching in the middle of the vegetable garden, pulling weeds. The sun is almost gone, but there's still enough light to see. We work for a few minutes side by side. I know she's dying to ask questions, but she waits a little while before saying, Uncle said you're going, you're to tell me what you know. I don't know everything, I say, and what I do know I found out only yesterday. I wasn't keeping it a secret from you, honest. I just hadn't found the right time to tell you. It's the truth. She looks doubtful, but nods for me to continue. Uncle works for the resistance, I tell her, for the illegal independence movement. He's been working with them for a while now. At night, and when no one's around, he prints a resistance newspaper. That's why he's forcing himself to be on good terms with all his Japanese customers. To make them think, think he's Chin Il Pa, so they won't suspect him. The relief I felt when I learned this yesterday. Uncle isn't Chin Il Pa. He's only pretending to be. So when that, so well that he even fooled me. I should have known better. I should ha never have doubted him. Soon he is so quiet I wonder if she's heard me. I look over at her. Her face is gray in the dim light. Finally she whispers, what else do you know? I tell her that Uncle said the police were hanging around the shop, a lot, for no reason. He thought they suspected him and that something might happen. But so soon? I don't think he thought it would be so soon. My question, my, my turn to ask questions. Did he say where he was going? She shakes her head. Into hiding, I think, I say, thinking hard. It's a big movement. He must have friends who will help him. But how did he find out? I mean... How did he know he should escape tonight? Soon he says, I told him. I look at her, my mouth open. I can't believe it. She told him? How did she know? She speaks again quickly. I mean, not because I knew. I didn't know anything. But Tomo came to see me tonight. He told me. I whistled between my teeth. Tomo, I never would have guessed. Opa, do our parents know about all this? I hesitate. She pushes out her lips. Uncle said you could tell me everything. All right, I say. Our parents know that Uncle works for the resistance, but that's all. Uncle doesn't want them to know anything more about that, and I think that suits Abuji just fine. He prefers it that way. I can feel my throat tightening a little, but I keep talking. Abuji also told Uncle to leave me out of it, but Uncle told me anyways because because he said it was important for me to know. Soon he gasped. I think she, well, I know what she's thinking. Uncle's going against Abuji's wishes? Soon he... I don't mean to be disrespectful to Abuji. My words come out slowly, but it's like he's blind to what's happening here. He goes to work, he comes home, and buries himself in his books. He doesn't care about what the Japanese are doing to us. As long as he can study his books, that's all that matters to him. Now she looks almost ill, hearing me talk about Abuji like that. She whispers, Opa, surely Abuji's only trying to protect Uncle. That's his job, to keep us all safe. I stand, taking a few steps away from her, and clench and unclench my fists. It's so hard to say what's in my head. I turn back toward her. What Uncle and others like him are doing, it's more important than anything. We aren't Japanese. We are Korean. But we'll never be allowed to be truly be Korean unless we have our independence. Uncle said these things to me only yesterday. And yet, as soon as he'd said them, I felt as if I'd known them all along, all my life. Soon he shakes her head and frowns. More important than family, she asks. But it's not one of her usual whiny little sister questions. She's thinking hard, I can tell. Our duty to Abuji is important. It's a part of our culture. But if the Japanese have their way, someday 
there won't be any such thing as our culture. When Uncle works for independence, he works for the right to live as Abuji wants us to. Do you see what I mean? I'm not sure, as sure of myself as I'm trying to sound. It's so confusing. Uncle is acting like Chin Il Pop when he's not. Tomo, the son of an official Japanese official, helping a resistance worker. Uncle disobeying Obuji in order to be able to obey him one day. If I can't fully understand, how can she? I walk back toward her, reach out my hand so I can pull her to her feet. We better go in now, I say, soon he. We shouldn't talk about this anymore unless it's truly necessary. And I don't, and don't trust anyone, not even Tomo. He helped us this once, but it can't be that easy for him. And who knows if he'll be sorry he did it. She looks stunned. She hadn't thought about that. Poor kid. We go back inside, sit down, pretend to study. After only a few moments, the megaphones blare. A neighborhood accounting all night, or at night. They're almost always in the daytime. It's about Uncle, I know it. They've raided his shop, and now they're searching for him. Abuji looks at us. His face is calm, but serious as well. He's telling us to be calm, too. Soon he leaves quickly to fetch Mrs. Mrs. An. We go outside and line up in the street. So many soldiers, lots more than usual. People are looking around, wondering. We save a place for Mrs. An. It's taking Soon he a while to bring her out. Amoni turns to me. You'd better go see, she starts to say. But just then, Soon he and Mrs. An hurry up to us. I look at Soon as she slips into line next to me. I couldn't find her at first, she whispers. She didn't answer the door, and finally I found her in the garden. Sure enough, on the other side of me, Mrs. An is fussing about dirt on her hands, using the corner of her apron to wipe them. We number off. Then the block leader starts talking. The usual spiel about His Majesty's Imperial Forces. I'm dreading what he'll say next about Uncle. He'll probably call him a traitor. I wish he'd get it over with. Metal, the block leader says. By order of the Imperial em Emperor, the army is commanding all household objects made of metal. It is needed for supply, so His Majesty's Imperial Forces can continue to spread his divine message to all people. Return to your homes and collect your metal. You may keep a few things, basic cooking tools, and a shovel, an axe, scissors, and needles. Everything else you must bring to the front gate. Next to me, soon he makes a choking noise turns toward me and grabs my arm. She looks so pale I'm afraid she might faint. They want metal? What about Uncle? Is he dangerous? Or has he gone into hiding for no reason? No time to think about it now. Abuji sends me to work to the work area to gather up all the metal things there. Amoni goes into her bedroom to fetch the jewelry. Outside the soldiers are shouting up and down the streets yelling for us to bring all the metal things in bags. Amoni comes out into the courtyard. She doesn't own much jewelry but she needs both hands to carry it. Some silver bracelets and rings, a gold hair ornament, a necklace, and a brooch. The last two were a wedding gift from Abuji's parents, a silver dragon on the necklace and another one on the brooch. Soon he seems almost frozen. She hasn't moved since we all came inside, but now she looks at Amoni. Not the dragon, she whispers. Her lips are white. I remember when she was little, she always used to beg Amoni to let her wear the brooch. It was her favorite because the dragon has a little pearl ball in its claw. Bring me the bag, Teyul, Amoni says, calm like a bougie. I've already put a bunch of metal stuff in an old rice sack. She drops the jewelry in a piece at a time, clink, clink, but not the brooch. All of us are watching her. She turns away a little, raises the hem of her skirt, and drops the brooch right into her underwear. Then she, then she smooths her skirt down again. A bougie makes a sound, sucking in air. He looks at Amoni for a long moment. She holds her head high. Finally, he nods. Take the bag to the gate, Teyul, he says. So I do. A military truck drives slowly down the street. Soldiers are taking bags and throwing them into the truck. Crash, clink, clang. The watch. I watch as the truck drives by. Our things, Amoni's jewelry, my tools. No, our tools. Mine and uncle's. Uncle. Uncle. I take off, running as fast as I can toward town. Halfway there, I remember that Abuji said I'm not supposed to leave the house. But it's too late now. I have to find out what's happening to Uncle. When I reach the street where Uncle's shop is, I slow down a little. Nothing. No soldiers. No commotion. Uncle's shop is shuttered, looking like it always does when it's closed. I go around to the back. No sign of any trouble. What's going on? I run all the way home. Soon he is in the courtyard. I don't mean to shout, but I can't stop the words from bursting out. What's happened? What happened? 
What have you done?